Hall in the Wood, pronounced locally as Hallith Wood, is a rare surviving example of a Tudor wooden framed house. It was originally built in the 16th century and during the 17th century it was owned by wealthy merchants and it was during this period it was given the Jacobean stone extension. In later years the building was split into several rented dwellings. It is in this period that Samuel Crompton moved in and invented the famous spinning mule. The spinning mule was the first multi-spindle machine capable of consistent fine yarn production. The mule is credited with the shaping of the north of England's cotton industry. Alith Wood was inhabited up until the late 19th century, after which it fell into disrepair. Thanks to the efforts of a local businessman, Lord Leverhulme, the building was saved and fully restored. He later presented the hall to Bolton Council as a public museum in 1902. Today you can see fine examples of 17th and 18th century furniture and period objects and artefacts. You can also discover the history of Samuel Crompton's invention and all about life in the Stuart and Tudor times. All the rooms have been accurately refurbished and retain an air of homeliness. the idea for this and introduce me to the world of Samuel Crompton. He's the well-known Bolton writer and poet, Harry Bood. And how are you today, Harry? Well, I'm still in fine fettle, Roger. Good. Harry, 
Where did you get the inspiration from for the song? Well, it all started for me, Rod, just 16 years ago. I worked for a famous company called Dobson and Barrows, who produced textile machinery at that particular time. But I do believe in 1790 the company was called Dobson and Rothwell, and they were friends of Crompton, and they produced the first spinning mules for Crompton. I was living up Harwood uh, for quite some time, pub I used to go into was called the house without a name and um, the landlord who was called Harry Corr had put an advert in our local paper advertising for local songwriters to come forward so this gave me the inspiration uh, to go and meet the landlord because I've always been writing songs for many years and at this particular time the Bolton Festival was coming up which was in head of Samuel Crompton so this really inspired me into writing the song. But unfortunately I was too late to present it to the festival, but I still didn't give up on the idea. And some years later I met up with you. Yes, I remember it well. You, you rang me up on the phone and said, would you like to write some songs? Uh, so I went round to your place and I knocked on the door and this voice from the bowels of the house <laughs> shouted, come in, the door's unlocked. So I went in and when I finally found you, there was this figure lying there with what I can only describe as the biggest plaster cast I've ever seen on his leg. <laughs> anyway, we, uh, you gave me the lyrics and of course one of the lyrics was the Samuel Compton song and as soon as I saw it I thought, well that's, that's got great potential. So, we, uh, so I got some music together and we, and we put the song together. We still had uh, lots of problems uh, getting people interested in the song, didn't we? Yes, we did, Roger, because at that time we tried to interest uh, a lot of uh, singing groups, but with no success, and even radio and uh, television. But still nobody wanted to uh, take up the idea of the song at all. No, that's right. I think in the end we decided, well, we've just got to do it ourselves. So that's how the record label, Lovely Company Records, came into, uh, came into being. And we wrote some more songs together, didn't we? Yes, we did. And, and uh, we put them on the album called The Samuel Compton Song, and uh, that's history, eh? It's a kind of phrase. Yes. But uh, um, when we got the album together, you managed to get a meeting with Dr. Gray, didn't you, at the Bolton Museum? Yes, uh, we went down to see Dr. Gray, and uh, we told him all about the cassette album of songs of Crompton, and he seemed to be very interested, and uh, he said that uh, we could market the songs in the uh, shop and uh, the museum and artifact shop. That's right, yeah, he gave us an order, <coughs> oh, and uh, that was it. And really from there, the song is now on sale, well, Wigan Pier? Well, with Wigan Pier, Roger, like you say, we've got uh, Style in Cheshire, uh, Elmshore at Rosendale. That's right, so it's, uh, it's going from strength to strength. Radio for the discerning listeners. It's all for you on 106.2 Radio Bolton. My name's Roger Spencer, and I'm here to tell the story of Bolton's most famous man, the legendary Samuel Crompton, inventor of the world-famous spinning mule. But how much do you really know about him? Samuel Compton was born on the 3rd of December, 1753, at Furwood Fold. But the story really starts when Sam was five years old, and the Compton family, Father George, Mother Betty, Sam and his two sisters, took up residence at the now famous Hollis Wood. Now Hollis Wood was a large house owned by the Starkey family. It had been empty for many years, and George Compton was taken on as a sort of tenant caretaker partly on the reputation his wife Betty had for good housekeeping. But almost as soon as they had settled, tragedy struck. Father George fell ill and died at only 32 years old. The family must have been devastated, but such was the strong character of Betty, she soon negotiated with the Starkey family, and the Cromptons were allowed to stay to look after the property, rear their livestock, and continue with their spinning and weaving. The results of the latter they take down to the Bolton Market, at the junction of Churchgate and Bradshergate, where the Market Cross still stands today. 
and merchants from miles around would come and buy the yarns and woven fabrics the locals had made. Samuel Crompton was fascinated with machinery, and with the help of his uncle Alexander, soon learned all there was to know about spinning and weaving. And so Sam's formative years were spent each day at the spinning wheel and weaving loom, then in the evening at school, and in his spare time, sometimes late into the night, dreaming up inventions. When Sam was fourteen years old, the greatest event of his young life occurred. James Hargreaves invented the spinning jenny. The spinning jenny was a major breakthrough for spinning. In comparison to the old spinning wheel, the jenny meant that multiple lengths of yarn could be spun at the same time. But it had serious limitations. The weft yarns were fairly satisfactory, but the warp yarns, particularly when the demand for lighter and old cotton cloth came along, were almost impossible. And as good a spinner as Samuel Crompton was, he often found that only one in ten yarns were good enough. As he said at the time, if one good, why not all good? So spurred on by the news of Arkwright's water frame, another spinning invention of the time, Samuel Crompton set his inventive dreams to work to solve the problem that Hargreaves and Arkwright had still failed to answer. It took five years of hard labour, of every spare minute of day and night. Local people would see lights moving about the upper windows of Hollith Wood, and rumours of ghosts and wizards abounded until in 1779 he had completed his first machine. Samuel Compton had achieved what the great leaders of industry with their power and money had failed to do. He had built a spinning machine that would spin any number of lengths of even the finest yarns to perfection. And when you consider that Samuel Compton was only 26 years old, it was a remarkable feat. Surely he was indeed a genius. To find out more about Samuel Crompton, I've come down to Hallith Wood, and I'm talking to Harold Farrell, who's the custodian of the Hallith Wood Museum. Harold, what would life have been like for the Crompton family living here all those years ago? Well, I imagine uh, it would be a very hard life, Roger. Um, they came down to Hallith Wood um, as tenant farmers, and uh, as many of the farmers in those days, they used to supplement the farming income by doing uh, weaving and spinning of cotton, just like many people today have sidelines. Then weaving and spinning was their sideline. And uh, Sam, as he helped with the spinning, he, um, he got to thinking that there must be a better way than just spinning one thread which he worked on the sacks of the spinning wheel and he got um, around to thinking that uh, there must be a better way. He must have been working under very difficult and trying circumstances uh, building an invention particularly late at night. Yes certainly because they of course didn't have the electric light or gas light at that time. They would be reliant on uh, candle light or rush lights and so as you say it would be under very difficult circumstances that he that he built the mule and he would only have basic hand tools as well. Um, he was a brilliant man in that he also uh, could play uh, an instrument, he played the violin. Um, he made his own violin as well and he used to play in the Bolton Orchestra of which he would have to um, either walk or go on, on horseback to um, the Bolton Theatre and he played there, and the money that he made um, from playing in the, in the uh, theatre uh, enabled him to purchase tools and various other things he would need to build the mule. He had a, a problem uh, after completing his work, didn't he? Shortly after uh, the invention of the mule, um, Roger, there was rather turbulent times at uh, Hallith Wood because the machine breakers was in the area and um, it had come to the knowledge of Sam and so he thought well all my hard work's not going to be destroyed by these people I'm going to dismantle um, the mule and hide it in the, in the attic in the roof space and even to this day 
you can still see the box um, area in the roof space where Sam actually hid the mule. He, um, he, he dismantled the machine and hoisted the uh, mule up in a crate up through the ceiling uh, of his workshop into the roof space. And um, it is hoped that when the um, at the completion of, of the work that's being carried out at Hollywood, um, that the general public will be able to go into the attic and view this this spot where Sam hid the mule. He finally left Hollywood, didn't he? Um, around the time he got married. Yes, he he got married while he was at Hollywood uh, after he invented the the mule, and um, he lived in cottages that adjoined uh, the hall at that time and he went to live in one of these cottages with his, uh, his new wife Mary Pimlot and then shortly after that they moved over to uh, a farm called Oldham's which is um, in the area where the Oldham's estate is now off Belmont Road and um, he lived there for quite some time when did Hollywood actually become a museum? Is that a recent yes. thing? Yes. Um, Lloyd Leverhulme came across the hall in um, late 1800s, 1890-odd, and uh, he saw that the hall was in very bad state of repair, and he thought, well, a fine building, fine Tudor building like this, uh, which were, at that time was just being used as a farmhouse. In fact, it was reputed that there was... Uh, cattle here in the Great Hall, um, so he, he purchased the hall with a view to restoring it, um, furnishing it as in 17th century furniture, and then presenting it to the Bolton Corporation, and it opened as a, um, Bolton's first folk museum in 1902. Samuel Compton's um, biographer, Gilbert French, um, made a very fine comment, really, about uh, Hollywood. <laughs> He mentioned that one hammer ringing out at Hollywood set thousands of hammers ringing out throughout the land. Samuel Crompton's spinning mule was producing what many manufacturers regarded as the best yarns in the country. And this presented problems for Sam. People were naturally inquisitive. They spied on him, peeping through windows, making holes in the roof to find out how he was achieving this amazing feat. Some shielded his invention from the outside world, but the situation was getting impossible. As he wrote at the time, A few months reduced me to the cruel necessity either of destroying my machine altogether or giving it up to the public. To destroy it I could not think of. To give up that for which I had laboured so long was cruel. I had no patent, nor the means of purchasing one. In preference to destroying, I gave it to the public. Had Samuel Crompton been a man of high social standing and wealth, he could have organized a patent for his invention. As it was, he was at the mercy of the business community. However, an agreement was signed by many prominent businessmen to make payments to Sam for the use of his invention. But this proved not to be worth the paper it was written on. As soon as they had learned his secrets, they simply refused to pay, dismissing his claims in the most callous manner. He was visited by Sir Robert Peel, and he offered Sam a job in one of his spinning concerns in exchange for information about his invention. The two men quarreled, for Sam was a proud man. Other wealthy manufacturers used to entice young men in Sam's employ with money to leave with the knowledge and training he'd given them. There followed an explosion of industry. Samuel Crompton's spinning mule completely revolutionized textile manufacture. Up to then, the old spinning process couldn't meet the demands of the weaving loom. Now the mule could provide mass production of high quality yarn. As a result, the industry expanded as never before imagined. Samuel Crompton was naturally an embittered man. Although he was now a celebrity, he had very little to show for it. He saw great mills and factories being built around him. One such place was the Quarry Bank Mill at Style, which today is a working museum where well, you can see spinning and weaving as it was done in years gone by. Samuel so Compton in just a few minutes after this small commercial break. Welcome back now to the next edition of Samuel Compton. The Samuel Compton story continues in 1802 
when a petition was launched by a Manchester spinner called John Kennedy, who asked manufacturers to subscribe to a fund for Sam, and at the same time pursued the government, who were reputed to be receiving up to £350,000 a year in duty from the industry. The petition raised less than £500, but it did enable the Crompton family to set up spinning and weaving at King Street in the centre of Bolton. But the business was only moderately successful, even though Samuel Crompton's skill with the machinery resulted in some unique designs being woven, there was no way to stop others copying them, and his reluctance to become more of a salesman and be more businesslike didn't help either. In 1811, Samuel Crompton discovered that in England, Scotland and Ireland, over four and a half million mule spindles were in operation. That over 700,000 people were directly or indirectly dependent on their livelihood on the yarns produced by spinning mules. And that four-fifths of the cotton goods bleached in Lancashire were woven from mule-spun yarns. So with the help of a local solicitor, he started a petition which was signed by many leading manufacturers and machine makers. And with the assistance of members of Parliament, he succeeded in placing his petition before Spencer Percival, the Chancellor of the Exchequer. A committee was appointed and reported to the House in Crompton's favour. But the Bolton man's luck took another cruel turn. On his way to the Commons to propose a £20,000 award for Sam, Spencer Percival was shot and killed by an assassin. It was a tragedy and a political crisis. But eventually the government felt obliged to make some gesture and agreed to award Samuel Crompton £5,000, a fraction of what was to be proposed. Sam used the money to take over the Whitehall bleachworks in Darwin. But as a brilliant inventor, he once again proved a poor businessman and the enterprise failed. Sam and his sons were also in business with a Richard Wilde and for a time ran a factory at Delft near Longworth just outside Bolton. But the bad luck that had followed him through his life struck again. A midnight flood broke down the weir and factory and machinery were swept away. As the years followed, other petitions were raised, based on the fact that from 1791 to 1816, the exports of the cotton trade had risen to over 20 million pounds a year, a colossal amount for those days. But the pleas fell on deaf ears and the petitions were ignored. Sam returned to Bolton to live with his daughter and her family in King Street, where they continued a small business. But as time went by, he became poorer and more miserable. And on the 26th of June, 1827, Samuel Crompton died, a broken man. I went down to the Central Museum and I was talking there to Dr. John Gray, who's the Chief Museum's officer, and I asked him, what did the future hold for Hawley's Wood? Well, the future for Hawley's Wood is that obviously our responsibility is to maintain the building. We have by law to maintain the building because it is a grade one listed building and the government uh, would prosecute us if we didn't. Uh, Hawley's Wood was last restored comprehensively in the 10th century by the first Lord Nidium. Uh, who then gave the building and purchased contents uh, and opened the museum in 1902. Since that time, other repairs have been done, but it's now time to look at the building in its entirety and look at what needs to be done. And this, is, this process is, of planning is now complete. The contractor is on site and in nine months' time, uh, after the roof has been off and put back on again, all the roofs should be safe and sound and weatherproof for the next 25 or so years at least. The opportunity has also been taken to look in detail at the furniture. We've had specialists come look at the furniture and the paintings and we've come up a conservation programme uh, for paintings and, uh, and furniture and we'll put in for a grant and next week perhaps we will hear about that and we intend to restore where necessary as many of the pieces as possible. The further opportunity that arises is to look at the way in which that material is displayed and whether there's material elsewhere in the museum collection as we would benefit being transferred to Hall of Wood. So the Compton connection will be maintained. Um, but we will take the opportunity to look at each room of the house and perhaps bring it a little more to life than it has been in the past. For instance, the Lancashire kitchen 
we can uh, make it look more like a kitchen by having uh, and other game hanging from the ceiling, uh, replica hams, uh, things like herbs and spices, and uh, giving the uh, impression, particularly to educational groups, that's how the building functioned as a family home. Because up until uh, the 18th, 18th century, it was a family home. It was then subdivided into tenements, and that's when Compton, the Compton family came to live there. And uh, from the end of the 18th century through to the beginning of the 20th century, the building was in a fairly part of state. Hopefully we can bring it back to a former glory. We will open to the public uh, again in April of next year, and if the building project goes, goes on schedule, we may even open earlier to, to adult groups and uh, school educational groups uh, prior to that date. So we're all looking forward to the time when we can have both will be stored back to its former glory and safe and secure for many years to come. Had Samuel Crompton lived in our age with its copyright and patent protection, he most certainly would have been an extremely rich man. As it was, he died almost penniless. And so we reach the end of our story of Samuel Crompton, who will always remain the pride of Bolton and the great inventor of the world-famous spinning mule. Yeah, it's an incredible story of Samuel Crompton. I mean, I must confess, I heard it when I was at school uh, in Manchester, but of course you, you never really hear the depth of it. You only get the sort of bits and pieces. Uh, I found it quite fascinating. My thanks to Roger Perry for giving me that a particular tape to play. I know he's listening, so uh, out there. Many, many thanks, Roger, and I hope you've got all the tape ready for me. On behalf of myself, Harry and Roger, we would like to thank Errol Farrell, Dr. Gray, for sharing their industrial knowledge on Samuel Crompton. We would like to leave you now with our album of songs from the spinning past. <laughs>
recording is also dedicated to all those who through their endeavors are preserving our industrial heritage. Oh, 
and is now a museum, a fitting tribute to the famous man of Colton, Samuel Crompton. <laughs>